Good morning and welcome. I'm Kate Bulkley and I'm here to run this first session. It's called A Full Set of Fangs. That's what we lovingly call the digital tech giants, some of which you uh, heard about a little bit on the screen, which was a very funny video. Interesting times um, we have. A Daily Telegraph splash headline this morning, one in five Britons is being harmed by the internet. Yes, we might hear more about that later from Sharon White. Uh, two, bidding for Sky, heated up, another ratchet you might have noticed last night. Looks like it's gonna be an auction. Do I hear 15 pounds, anyone? Yes. Um, and then, of course, we have the reported bid by ITV to spend three billion, four billion, who knows, whatever they can get. The bankers wanna push the number up uh, for Endemol Shine. So there's a lot going on in this space. And this session is basically meant to look at the consumer, creative, and commercial impact of the FANG companies on what's happening uh, to all of us and all the broadcasters and all the um, content creation companies. And we have a lineup of great people here to talk about it. Essentially what we're looking at are mergers and acquisitions the only way forward for broadcasters and producers. When it comes to doing battle with the tech giants, AKA the FANGs, is bigger, better. So let me introduce my panel. We have far right to me, we have David Abraham. He is a Renaissance British, a man of British media. Um, I also was just with him in Amsterdam. <laughs> with successful careers in advertising, paid TV, and the CEO of public broadcaster at Channel 4. His latest reincarnation, which I'm sure uh, you've heard about, if you haven't, he will tell you about it, is his own production business called Wonderhood Studios. He's also the only British TV executive I know who has a channel named after him. Right, David? Dave. Uh, Tom. Tom Mockridge, he is the CEO of Virgin Media. He's aiming to electrify the take up of ultra fast broadband in UK households uh, through the expansion of your fiber network, which of course is very aptly named Project Lightning. He also enjoys the unique distinction of having dressed up as Usain Bolt in lime green lycra as a ninja turtle and lived to tell the tale. On my left, we have <laughs> Jane Turton. I, I didn't write all these, by the way. Uh, she <laughs> she's a superwoman of a super indie. You're bidding for world domination. Uh, and, I and I'm wondering if the current actress for Wonder Woman, Cal G Gal Gadot, if she steps aside, I think Jane could take up her, her slot easily. Uh, Jane leads the largest based independent uh, production business in the UK, no less than 27, count them separate production companies under her vast umbrella. Last but not least, we have Darren Troop. He is the CEO of Entertainment One. It runs one of the world's largest content and production distribution studios across film, TV, and music. Uh, it was once rejected the billion pound advances of an acquisition hungry ITV. Hmm. Uh, he is also the man who could be called the godfather of Peppa Pig. His company also, uh, that gives you one image, his company, company also distributes The Walking Dead. I'll leave that to your imaginations of how those two uh, properties come together. In this session, we are going to have a lot of research from Deloitte um, to set up the debate and to give us some supportive documentation. Uh, they're all downloadable on the RTS app, so when they flash up on screen, don't panic, you can get to them. Uh, let me start by queuing the first uh, video, so let's watch that. Well, we are clearly living through some kind of massive TV gold rush. Everybody is piling into TV at the moment. Well, the new entrants have uh, huge reserves of cash to invest in, in content. So for the existing players, this is going to mean extra competition, lower profits and a harder life overall. It's not entirely clear what these new entrants are going to invest their money in and it's not entirely clear how they're going to distribute that content. I think lumping together all the different fangs into one homogenous group is the wrong interpretation. I think each of these companies has a different motivation. But the impact of new players uh, is a good thing. Uh, it gives new opportunities for the creative community, uh, allows new voices and talent to be nurtured, um, and more investment in technology and the customer experience. So overall, it's a good thing. 
I've no doubt Apple will make a huge success of it, given Jay's appointment. Um, but it's very, very early to tell, I think, in terms of the real impact it'll have. No doubt in the longer term, it'll provide extra choice for consumers, which can only drive everyone to want to raise their game. I think the arms race for content is going to continue to intensify over the next few years. There's no doubt about that. I think one of the really interesting questions is who will follow Apple, Facebook and so on. There's talk of Walmart entering the industry now. And so while there's going to be an arms race in international drama, and that will go on, the programmes that we really care, that, and we love watching those shows, you know, pizza on the knee, box sets, you know, the crack cocaine of the next episode available in the credits of the last one and all the rest of it, we know all that. But there's still going to be, and there still ought to be, a fantastic demand for great content about our own territory made by producers in our own territory. In a world of increasing choice, no single player is going to be able to be all things to all people. Uh, and I think anyone who tries to do that will ca ca get caught in the middle and will probably fall by the wayside. By 2023, we expect 20% of viewing amongst the 55 plus audience to shift on demand. Everyone we talk to, they've got a millennial strategy. Virtually no one we talk to has a strategy for the older generation, those over 55. Economic madness. Already we see, say on YouTube, that viewing is 59 minutes per day, but over 70% of that is on mobile devices. So I think that viewing shift to mobile is key. Mobile, we really need to understand that people are now not afraid to watch an entire series of Netflix on a screen that size. They don't need a 46 inch TV anymore. Faced with this huge increase in choice in content, tech savvy consumers at least are going to be turning to content recommendation algorithms uh, to sort through everything that's available to them. I don't think we want to end up in a world uh, as we've seen uh, on Facebook where people become increasingly kind of stuck uh, in, a, in, in the narrow confines of their immediate um, immediate interests. A dramatic change tends to happen when a new technology emerges that meets an existing need in a much better way than previously. And actually, people's viewing needs are being pretty well met by the variety of uh, TV services that are available at the moment. Oh, it's very dangerous to make predictions about TV. Look at, look at all the fuss around 3D and uh, what subsequently happened there. I think it has to be broadband penetration on public transport. Um, if you commute any day of the week and you look around, everyone is looking at a screen and it shows that people are willing to consume content in that environment. We've only begun to people the facia of the um, connected TV with all the possibilities. So that's going to be the biggest um, opportunity actually for both consumers, viewers, and broadcasters. For me, mobile is the thing that's most shaping consumption and behavior, and will probably continue to do so in the next five years. If we look at 16 to 24 year olds, the hours of their viewing that are being done on mobile phones is significant. So what we've seen very recently is smartphone chip launches, which have got kind of technological capabilities that was previously only available in far larger um, devices. So that's allowing machine learning and artificial intelligence into the smartphone. The innovation that I think will have the biggest impact on audiences will be virtual reality. I think it will probably take a little bit longer than we expect uh, to really deliver that, but I think when it does then I think it will be transformational. Well actually I think the goal of the technology is to get out of the way um, and simply make it easy for customers to find and watch what they want. Okay, so let's start with the creative impact of all this, right? And I'm going to start with Darren and Jane. You know, we, we heard on the VT billions are being poured <laughs> into getting content uh, from the big fan companies, the tech companies. Darren, when you look at this, um, are a higher percentage of your revenues now coming from these guys, from the Netflixes, the Amazons, maybe the Apples? as opposed to your usual um, people, the, you know, the broadcasters, is that changing what you're doing? Is that making it, let's say, at the expense of custom from the broadcasters? Is there starting to be a shift? 
Yeah, I mean, certainly a bigger portion of our, our revenue is coming, are, are coming from Netflix, Amazon, not yet Apple, although that's emerging quickly, and we're gonna see that change very quickly. I think really what it's um, meant for us as a company is that we have to be very flexible in the way that we're putting packages together and the way that we're selling packages from an international standpoint. In some instances, you will sell the entire show to a Netflix on a global basis, but in other instances, like the Rookie, which we're doing right now with ABC in the US, we've done ABC in the US, Bell in Canada, and another 160 broadcasters around the world. Mm -hmm. So packaging the media or the content in different ways to serve you know, our interests first and then the interests of our customer, which are the broadcasters and the platforms. So I guess that's my question. Let me put a finer point on it. How important is it to you to make sure the broadcasters continue to be competitive? Well, it's incredibly important for us. The more customers... I mean, do you make sure you give them business, if you see what I mean? Because if Netflix comes and says, hey, Darren, here's a huge check. Yeah, what we like to do is we like to hold on to rights if we can. Mm -hmm. in, and we're pragmatic about it. So in each instance, if we can hold on to the rights from a global standpoint and possibly mine those rights in second or third window, mm -hmm. that would be our, our go-to uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. we can't, we have to be pragmatic and sell it to who will buy it. Mm -hmm. So the, the broadcasters, which have been our customers forever, continue to be a very, very important piece of that chain. Okay, so Jane, you know, drill down to this a little bit more. It seems like the traditional broadcaster producer model is, if not under threat, changing. There's, there's some pressures. So what does that mean for you? What does that mean for, let's say, terms of trade? What, talk, talk about what this means for your business. Yeah, uh, look, I, I think it's good. So it's, it's a positive thing. Um, I think you may see later from Deloitte, some of the numbers, um, certainly coming through the UK, suggest that from 2008 to today, there hasn't really been any increase, any perceptible increase in the amount of money spent on primary commissions mm. in the UK. So this new money coming in is a positive thing. Yeah. That, that, I think that's the first obvious point to make. Um, I think what's also interesting is that you know some of the, the sort of disruption, as people like to call it, um, is actually being led as much by the traditional broadcasters mm. as it is by the newer players. So look at what the BBC is doing with Killing Eve. You know, they've turned their normal model completely on its head. Yeah. I don't know how many people travelled here by public transport today. You cannot help but notice <laughs> the posters on the sides of buses and at Vauxhall Tube Station and so on and so forth. And that's, you know, show the BBC commission from Sid Gentle, written by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, went out first in America, came back to the UK, and has been dropped simultaneously every episode on the iPlayer. Sadly, not one of our shows. A fantastic example of the disruptor. And she the didn't disrupt win the Emmy. She didn't no, win the, the Emmy. No, but the disruptor in chief, the BBC, who would have thought, yep. busting its normal model, yep. um, you know, completely. So. And There's the idea, I think, behind that, because I was talking to Tim Davey about this, he said it was because he felt that that was what was needed for this show. Oh, look, I'm sure there's a whole heap of reasons. It's mm. probably partly economic, knowing mm. Tim Davey. It's probably partly um, for that reason as mm. well. Um, yeah. but, but it's interesting. It's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not just about the aggregate amount of money coming in either. It's some of the sort of interesting consequences of this stuff. Look, as a producer, what do you want? You want to be commissioned and you want an audience. The thought that Free Rain, which is a show we make out of Lyme for 12, 14 year olds, is dropped simultaneously into I think 194, mm. 184, 194 territories around the world by Netflix, is extraordinary. Mm. Um, what, you know, about, what about local content? Are we, are we in a moment where we're going to lose the localness of content? Because no, these big guys the want to have big stars, they want to have international players, they want to have international themes. I think they've got a whole portfolio of content on there. Some of their most successful shows currently are so-called local. Mm. Um, there's a show called um, Netflix's commission called Casa del Papa, mm -hmm. um, Papel, um, which is a Spanish language show that's been dubbed and is now, I suspect, although one never knows the numbers in the case of Netflix, yeah. one of their most successful shows. Mm. Um, Equally, there are other examples. We're making a show in India called Selection Day about cricket for Netflix, British and Indian cast, crew, mm. Um, mm. depicting an Indian story for a global audience. So, David, so I, I don't yeah. think local is out by any means. Okay. It's, it, it's, it's, it's about quality. It's about quality. Yeah. So, David, let me ask you the same sort of question, because it seems to me that, you know, with your hat on as being a former PSB running Channel 4, you know, is, is there a core strength in local that PSBs have? Is that going to continue to be a core strength? Or are we going to start seeing the fangs coming in and, I mean, Jay Hunt's now working for Apple. She'll probably, maybe she'll start, I don't know, commissioning locally. So I, th I think that the known unknown here is, is, is around where the market will be in three, three to five years time. Because if you project out, let's say 
I mean, and it may not be fanciful that Amazon and Netflix double what they spend with UK producers, mm -hmm. and Apple get to where Netflix uh, is. You, you can see that this argument about the local broadcasters still having a direct relationship with audiences with local content gets to an, a point of imbalance. We, we seem to be quite a way away from that at the moment. So it, it, mm. it, I think there is a three to five year period in which this kind of experimentation of direct relationships between the PSBs and their audiences can evolve competitively. Um, but you know, one can imagine a situation where there is more UK content being produced by UK producers for the fangs than the PSBs. I mean, mm. it doesn't, you, you, can, you can model that out, and that's an interesting point to get to. From my point of view... But is that a threat to the PSBs? I mean, is that a threat to Channel 4 suddenly that they're well, not the home of... In the, weirdly, in, you know, now that I'm much lower down in the food chain of all of these uh, issues, <laughs> uh, the world is full of partnerships and opportunities, and I think one of the interesting <laughs> things about these, these events and the debates that are going to happen today is to separate out the sort of digital regulatory issues that the PSBs are clearly aligning themselves around with the need for partnership and collaboration, which is how the business actually operates. Mm -hmm. Everyone's co-producing with everyone, mm -hmm. everyone's partnering with everyone. The notion that, um, that there aren't really creative and interesting deals to be done, I think, is... Is, is wrong, it, you, you know, the announcement last week between Channel 4 and Sky, for example, is a really innovative moment, I think, and there are gonna be many more like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, weirdly, some of the noise is very different to what's going on in the ground in terms of kind of making interesting ideas happen. Yeah, but some of that's happening because of the threat from the fang. so obviously it makes sense for Sky to work with. It is and it isn't. Channel it's also, 4. people need to make shows and they mm. need to fund okay. them and they sure. want to market them and position them globally in effective ways. And, Everyone talks to everyone, and I think we've got to separate the rhetoric from the practicality of okay. this business operates when people have great ideas and they're passionate about making them happen. And now, as Darren said, there's just hundreds of more extra ways to make them happen. One of the things that I've been hearing about um, recently is short form, and I'm going to come to you first, Darren. Short form content seems to be getting a whole new life. I mean, we have Jeffrey Katzenberg putting a billion dollars into a short form fund. I think you're a part of that through Liberty. Um, what about short form premium? Is that really a growth area for content creation? I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure the model's proven on actually making any money on it. So what, what's, the, what's the big push here? Well, I think the big push really speaks to consumer behavior. If you look at the incidence of, of smartphone screen use, it's, it's, it's exploding. Mm -hmm. So meeting that market with high quality content is something that you know, needs to be explored and done. So Jeffrey's platform, New TV, is meeting and trying to find a way to meet that demand. It's clear that, especially for younger viewers, uh, the smartphone is their go-to um, item. Their viewership is exploding. So, you know, the high quality uh, portion of that in 10 second increments, it's really about storytelling. At the end of the day, it goes back to the best ideas and the best stories. Um, nobody's really cracked that model from a monetization standpoint. I think from a YouTube, uh, if you look at YouTube, some of our children's properties are incredibly viewed billions of views on a, on, a, on, a, on a monthly basis for Peppa Pig, for instance. Yeah, because that's in China, isn't it? With, it's in China, it's all over the world. But and you from, basically cut it up into shorter... No, it is short form anyway. So okay. it's a five and a half minute segment. That's the way it's produced. Mm -hmm. That's the entire story arc is so five and a half minutes. Yeah. So it fits perfectly on short form. So, mm -hmm. and you know, kids are looking at iPads and mm -hmm. they're looking at phones. So it's already met that market demand. As we extrapolate that market into a higher demographic or age group, you're going to have to serve them different content than cat videos on YouTube. <laughs> so, I mean, and but you know, we're testing and we're and we're watching and we're participating in the in the new TV with Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. um, so, oh, so you're also an investor too. Yes, we are. Okay, yeah. so you're an investor and you're an investor through Liberty Global, right? So, do you have like a first look deal with these guys? I mean, wh how much do you want to produce for these people with Katzenberg? <coughs> no, we, don't, we don't have a first look as it happens, but we'd love to produce for him. Um, it's interesting what he's doing. Um, we're talking to him, I'm sure you are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's scripted, which yep. is an interesting starting which point. Which is an interesting starting point. Yes. Really interesting. It's ambitious, obviously, it's, and it's Jeffrey Katzenberg, so why wouldn't you? I mean, it, it's, it's going to be fascinating to see how that goes. Mm. Let's go into consumer impact now. Um, we've got a couple slides, if you could pop those up. Slide one, forecast growth in SVOD use by 55 plus. So you can see what's going on there. We heard a lot of reference to this in the tape. 
earlier. And then slide two, forecast reduction in number of UK TV broadcasts attracting audience of five million plus. So obviously the sort of mass audience is going down. So Tom, let me bring you in. I'm sorry you've had to wait a bit. Um, what are the strategic implications of the shift from linear to on demand? I mean, it looks like that's starting to happen. What does that mean? Do you think that's gonna help Virgin Media? Is that gonna help consumers? What? Well, look, absolutely. I think what came through that VT and a lot of the comments we've had since mm -hmm. is that this change is demand-led. So it's the consumer mm -hmm. that is driving it, and clearly the technology is enabling, but it really is people uh, creating a larger audience and uh, around, around the technology opportunity. Uh, we at Virgin Media launched last night a 4K channel. Mm. We would like to say the UK's first four, uh, solar 4K channel. And in conjunction with that, we did a survey. Uh, it, uh, I think by three to one, people said TV today is better than it ever has been. Mm. And when you looked at the reasons for that, the primary reason was choice, and the next two reasons were technology and streaming. Uh, so no surprise in any of that, but it sort of validates exactly what we're but saying. So I think the key 4K thing is about like, quality. So they, do they want those high I quality think pictures? There's, there, there's a will piece, they pay for it? <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's a piece of people that, no. that do and will, mm -hmm. and there's some other people that uh, are happy to have mm -hmm. a more traditional viewing and, mm -hmm. and, and a whole range of things in between. But I think the overall message, and I think it's been pretty consistent at these conferences in recent years, is that the demand is growing, if not exponentially, whatever the, something pretty close to exponentially is, <laughs> and that's creating all these opportunities. And so it's, it's terrific for the industry, and it's a question, uh, as, as others on the panel have already said, how does the industry step into that, mm -hmm. particularly being in the UK as an English-speaking market, with, with maybe opportunities that other mm -hmm. uh, national industries don't have, to yeah. take advantage of it internationally as well as domestically. Mm, interesting. So, David, when you look at this, do you think that... Um, when the PSBs are starting to compete increasingly in on-demand viewing environment. I mean, if, if we start seeing this happening, you know, greater increase in VOD viewing, um, do you think that this is, a, this is gonna happen and we need to have sort of some kind of joint venture among the PSBs to do VOD? I mean, is that the next step? Well, clearly, I'm not, I'm not in the room with those conversations. And I think you have to go back to that kangaroo decision over a decade ago to mm -hmm. see that history could have been very different, but we are now where, where we are. And, um, you know, the PSBs have been very innovative. I mean, let's remember iPlayer, um, ITV Player, all, all four. The, these services preceded, you know, they were, they were around when Netflix was still posting DVDs in, in letterboxes. So we should recognize that the, the British uh, system has, has, you know, lent into this change and I think can continue to do so uh, individually. The big debate clearly right now is about EPG prominence and whether or not there can be enough PSB portals on that landing page, the sort of mythical landing page that everyone's trying to control. The fact yeah. is that there are just so many of the landing pages, so how to regulate that's going to be, yeah. would be really interesting. And, and, how, yeah, and how do you figure out prominence in an app world? I mean, it's Yeah, very but difficult. I mean, look, it's been very clear that, that, that Ofcom are going, to, um, are going to be looking at this very closely. And I think as someone who kind of lived through that difference between sort of regulatory frameworks and legislative frameworks, mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the other known unknown here is, is will we have a government that will come together and legislate and how to separate out these quite mechanical issues around EPG prominence from the very much broader issues of internet safety that ran in the Telegraph this morning, which are very kind of broad and macro and things about tax, et cetera. I mean, they seem to be so yeah. sort of broad and mm. macro, and that's mm. where a lot of political heat seems to be out there at the moment about mm -hmm. sort of bashing mm -hmm. Facebook. Mm -hmm. But that's a long way away from kind of what we're talking about, and, and yet weirdly in the discourse it's sort of getting connected, and I don't, I don't quite understand how that happens. So David doesn't really want to be draw drawn on the SVOD alliance. Do you have a view on that? Do you think that the PSB should be working on a joint subscription Netflix killer thing in the UK? Strong PSBs are good things for us, aren't they? So if that strengthens them, I mean, it's a rather lazy answer. Um, Again, like David, I'm not in the room. Mm. It, it, Be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Mm. All right, let's move on to our next uh, VT. We're going to talk about uh, commercials. Let's roll that VT to cue us up.
look, there's no doubt the emergence of new OTT services have fundamentally disrupted existing pay TV providers. Um, the most recent report from Ofcom showed that subscriptions to Now TV, Amazon and Netflix have now surpassed a number of traditional pay TV subscribers. Um, I don't think that need be a systemic decline. So I think current subscribers won't be as inclined to cord cut as we think, but new subscribers who come online and set up their new homes, they will be used to being to having other services. So I think uptake will probably be much, much slower and much harder for people like Sky to get new subscribers. But actually cord cutting might be a bit slower than we thought it would be. This is one of those questions that I have a slight issue with. I'm not I'm not sure um, that cord cutting is taking place in the UK, it feels like it's a US phenomenon and we're just importing the language. People may well spend as much on their content as they currently are, but with more suppliers. By 2023, um, every household in the UK will have at least three pay TV subs. And that's driven by the fact that teenagers can spend quite literally a tenth of their pocket money on pay TV subscriptions and the fact that 95% of our households, even today, can get super fast broadband, which means you can run a series of concurrent pay TV um, subs within the same household. I think VOD service uh, suppliers will realise that they're much better off operating as frenemies than competing head on. Um, so, for example, Netflix being offered as part of Virgin is a great instance of that happening. Fundamentally, there are more people paying for television, and I think that trend will continue over the next five to ten years to the point where you know, almost all households will, um, will be subscribing to, to, to a set of content services. TV clearly has some pretty fearsome global competitors. TV consumption is holding up pretty well in the UK and there is still strong demand for advertisers for its brand building powers which are really unrivaled by other media. We expect TV audiences to continue to atomise. By 2023 we expect a large audience to be about 3 million as opposed to 5 million now. Um, that will still be a very large audience compared to the simultaneous audience that any other medium can bring together. I don't think many media agencies or clients compare TV advertising to digital as apples versus apples. I think it's not as simple as TV versus digital. It's really about the various roles of advertising, whether that's brand building, generating a response, and finding the best and the most efficient ways to deliver that function. When you invest in TV and online video together, you drive the highest ROI rather than investing in just TV or just online video. Going forward, um, TV needs to continue to provide a mass reach, high quality, brand safe environment for advertisers, which it does at the moment. And if it can continue to do that, it should fare well. I think layered on top of that, it also needs to continue to innovate in being able to provide more targeted propositions to advertisers. Nothing works better than TV advertising. TV advertising generates 71% of all the profit generated by advertising full stop. So you simply can't get uh, a better use of advertisers' money than to spend it on TV. The only thing holding television back is the brand challenge, the perception challenge, that it isn't as groovy or as trendy. Actually, it offers bang for your buck, it offers flexibility, it offers safety and trust. So um, what's holding television back? Uh, I think television advertising will grow, not diminish. Okay, positive note from um, Mr. Bazalgette. Um, Tom, let me start with you. Um, we have some slides as well, which, I can, which I'll, I'll, I'll queue up as well, but I want you to talk a little bit about cord cutting. This has sort of been a US phenomenon, but, I, but the question is whether it's coming to the UK. Um, uh, so what do you think about that? Do you think it's? I think the VT nailed it. You're making the panel redundant. Um, the, the, the cord well, I'm the, sure you can say something the, interesting. Come on. The cord in the UK is the broadband. Yes. And I think partly historically, uh, what, the, what the Americans and Canadians call cable was decades before the industry really um, really rolled out here. Mm. And of course, a, a lot of the rollout here was satellite in any case. So the cord now is cable. So it's not been cut, it's been adopted. And that goes back to that earlier point, it's creating more demand, it's giving people more choice, it's creating all those opportunities. So, the so I think it's really, it's a, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a it's a, it's question. It's a broadband cord. Yeah, yeah, it's a question in the past. I, mm. um, it's, a, it's, fundamentally not, it's fundamentally not an issue. Mm -hmm. People are buying, uh, continuing to buy, um, uh, linear pay TV, people are continuing to watch 
PSB channels and people in addition are buying the over-the-top services and on-demand services. So let's look at these slides. Slide three, forecast uh, video subscriptions by household. Yeah, average three videos per household. And then the second one is SVOD revenues versus pay TV revenues. So if you see that, Tom, yeah? Yeah, and the, chart, and the total's going up. Mm -hmm. That's the point. So I like the red line, I like the purple line. <laughs> Um, the, um, so I think sometimes we're sort of looking, 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 looking for the looking for the threat, the challenge. I mean, some of the language is pretty negative, isn't it, about yeah, something yeah. that is growing? I mean, there's lots of industries aren't growing. I mean, I spent a while, as you're aware, back in the newspaper industry, and there, if the decline was That's arrested right. to five percent a year, that was good news. Mm. I mean, this this business is growing across the board. So, David, if you look at this. Um, you know, is low growth or no growth pay TV? I mean, it is not, it's low growth, it's not no growth. Um, do you see more disputes with platforms coming, you know, in terms of carriage fees? I mean, we've had, what you used to run a little company called UK TV, they had a little spat with Tom and Virgin Media over their carriage fee. Do you Beautifully think resolved though, Tom, absolutely. Beautifully resolved, <laughs> yes. How long did that take? Um, it, uh, uh, honest answer, it took three weeks. There was a, there was a um, don't you think there'll be more? There? There'll be more of those, though, don't you think? Because you, no, you're, you've got, you're under pressure with your economics. With, with, with change coming, there's always the possibility of that, absolutely, of course. And, um, um, and you know, in some respects, these sorts of disputes are maybe more common uh, outside the UK and uh, with the dynamic of change. And uh, we clearly thought we wanted to defend the way our customers were viewing, and um, Darren and the team at UK TV um, uh, were defending their position. They're good people, good channels, we're happy. But do you think this is going to be a phenomenon? It's going to continue, right? I mean, the Well, fortunately, I'm, it's just not a, a, an area of pain I have to deal with anymore. Um, but no I, area I, of pain, yeah. The, the, I think what's very interesting is, is sort of just moving it into sort of where competition, the new edge of competition is the difference between I suppose when we talk about fangs, there's really two types of kind of, there's two areas, aren't there? Because there's the streamers who, and if you're selling shows, the streamers feel more like channel, quasi channels now. They've got commissioning editors, they're hiring people from the known world, they've got genres. It, it sort of feels like Netflix is a channel. Hmm. Uh, whereas if you're going into Facebook or YouTube or um, where, where the sort of mobile video, short form, that feels sort of that, that there's a digital edge there where if rights begin to move, you know, ten, tennis to Amazon or, you know, football in parts of the world to Facebook, then, then in a sense, to what extent do those players begin to be quasi-channels? And I think, you know, again, when I talk to suppliers or agents, you know, you get the feeling that is very much where the Wild West is. No one really knows mm. exactly what they want or what mm. genres are working cat videos work, so let's make programs about pets, you know, that yeah. seems about, about as much as I've learned about Facebook so far. Um, <laughs> but, but that, you know, that, that seems, you know, where will we be in three to five years' time once that, once they look more like quasi-channels, or is that the direction they're going, or is that the area of strength they're playing to, mm. or, or, or will their area of strength be in this short form, short storytelling, and that, for me, that links very directly into how brand advertising will work in this new world because, strangely, advertising is increasingly working in longer time lengths, partly because of the ad break having less reach, so therefore the paid for 30 or 40 or even 60 second commercial, which is still holding up the commercial PSBs, uh, is really almost like a shop window into a content strategy which is being exploited off those channels and into social where it's partly paid for and then partly hopes to be shared. So everyone is producing a really high-end brand commercial at the moment. If you go to Cannes, everyone's aspiring and measuring the success of that through a combination of the reach they're paying for and the hope that it will be shared uh, in what's, I suppose, called mid-form commercial programming, which is a sort of whole new way in which I think advertising is going to work in the future. It's interesting what Dave is talking about, Jane and, and Darren. I mean, this kind of um, native content or, I don't know, advertising-sponsored funded content. Do you think this is a big growth area? Is it because of the way things are, the dynamics are changing with the... Well, it's definitely a big challenge. I mean, I think David's spot on. I think the sort of biggest challenge for us as content producers is to get people to watch content. I know mm -hmm. that sounds obvious, but 
certainly a younger demo, so get them off Instagram into content. Um, and how do you do that? Well, it must be about the quality of the content. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're, we're experimenting, all of us. Um, I think platforms aside, I think producers have the job also of trying to get more into this sort of whole integrated space, much more conversation with advertisers mm -hmm. via platforms, of course, yeah. but, you know, how do we use tech? Funnily enough, we asked our tech guys yesterday what should we talk about when we're asked your question about tech? And their answer actually has nothing to do with consumption. Hmm. It's to do with production. Production. So how do you use AI? How do you use, you know, everything to do with the algorithm to try to make sure you're tailoring content in a way that appeals to the younger demo that may be more elusive? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think our challenge is to make sure our content is so unbelievably, desirably watchable that they will find it and they will watch it. Um, so to what David's saying, I think he's absolutely right. It's, it's for us, I think it's, it's, it's getting them into the content. And, for exa and, and they surprise you. So we've mm. got a channel called Real Stories on, on Little Dot, um, which Little Dot runs, which is documentaries. Short, mid, long form, some original, some archive. This stuff has been consumed by um, people, uh, you know, uploaded or whatever the word is nowadays, dropped, whatever, <laughs> from Shoreditch <laughs> in London and watched mostly in America. Yeah. Huh. And these are British author docs that directors have been sitting on and desperate to get an audience for. You find a way to get that so that it's accessible and people come to it because it's quality. So, so I think there's some weird yeah. myth-busting stuff going yeah. on in there as well. Yeah, in terms of how you think about content yeah. and what you do with yeah. it and the technology as he well. He argues the algorithm tells him that, Andy Taylor. Really? We all laugh mm. and say, don't be ridiculous, it's about creative genius, and he says it's an algorithm. So in there somewhere, there's something that's going to be really curious. And, and, and commissioners are increasingly interested in, in commissioning long-form shows that have a sort of social yeah. kind of halo around them that often is preceded yeah. in short or mid-form content that is then sort of surrounding the arrival of the show. And I think that whole interrelationship, it's kind of, in a way, it's content marketing for shows is very similar to how brand marketing is now doing. So the skill, the skill sets are overlapping quite considerably. So Darren, let me bring you in. I mean, I was talking to someone from Viacom, actually, in Amsterdam at the IBC show, and they were talking about how they're creating a new piece of uh, content off of an old IP, sort of minor characters in SpongeBob, and they put it on Snapchat. And, they, and it was a very interesting commercial model. Are you starting to think of these kind of things? Are you starting to think of new commercial models for content? Yeah, absolutely. We, um we do it with our family brands all the time where we've got the core content, which again for PEP is five and a half minutes, but we'll make short form, shorter form content specific to market. So mm -hmm. for the Chinese market that you mentioned before, there's Chinese content being produced specifically for China. I think on the, the brand side, the brands are having a hard time getting to their customers. The advertising model has shifted. So especially for the young, younger demographic, I think we see brands as commissioners of content as opposed to the traditional broadcasters or the platforms. And you don't mind that? You don't think that's a, you know, breaking down of the, the no. Chinese, sorry to use that term, the Chinese wall? The no, not at all. I mean, our, it's our primary job as, as producers to get the content into the hands of the consumers. And if the brands are going to facilitate that, uh, we should be working as closely with them as we can. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a big opportunity for us. Before we leave this section, um, I want to ask you a little bit about um, uh, direct-to-consumer services of you guys. In other words, you know, we're hearing everyone's getting into direct-consumer, you know, Disney Life. Um, yeah. Is this something that as big production houses, I mean, is there going to be a Peppa Pig direct-to-consumer channel? We have, we have a Peppa Pig direct-to-consumer app right now that's, um, that's used by, it's, a, it's a basically a subscription app that's been downloaded many, many, many times. Uh, direct to consumer for us would be YouTube, where we've got a relationship with the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, but do you but make enough money off that? I mean, I'm not convinced that it's there's all actually, incremental. It's, it's all, all incremental. incremental. It's all part of it. And because for us, that's, that's a, IP you're just recutting. It's not like you're shooting new IP. But on a brand, what we're looking for is exposure and eyeballs and engagement from mm -hmm. the consumer. So as many platforms as we can extrapolate that same content across is very good for us. Mm -hmm. As far as launching an SVOD platform or a, you know, a VOD platform to compete with the FANG companies, you know, we're just not of the size and scale to do that. We've taken the position, we're agnostic to delivery, so you know, we'll sell to you know, who wants our contest in the, in the worst way or the, the most, <laughs> um, but we certainly don't see ourselves as competitors. We see ourselves as suppliers. We're agnostic to delivery, so we sell to everyone. 
um, the kind of money that you would need to you know, launch a service. You could do it specific to a brand, but to launch a Netflix-like service is in the billions of dollars, and that's not really our place. I assume you agree with that, Jane? Yeah, yeah so. definitely. Okay, let's look at another slide, which is about um, impact, and this is chart five for our tech team. Forecast digital video ad revenues versus TV ad revenues. Right, so you can see what's going on. Obviously, we know who's hoovering most of that up. It's uh, our good friends, Google and uh, Facebook. Um, David, let me come back to you. Are, do you think that the, the TV industry is doing enough to exploit some of the things that Lindsay talked about in the, in the clip, you know, brand safety, measurement? Are, are they really, I mean, is this a, a moment when they should be leaning into those kind of advantages that TV advertising has? I think they have been. I think that, you know, if, you know for those people who go to Upfronts and, and, and look at the kind of industry debates, the, you know, the, the YouTube kind of challenges of last year were, you know, they were, they were exposed very dramatically and from what I can tell, they were addressed uh, very substantially. I mean, the thought that these digital uh, giants are now employing tens of thousands of people around the world to effectively screen, uh, screen content more, more effectively um, is, is a very big change. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, as with all things in, in the digital world, it's kind of evolving through what we're, what we're learning. The latest crisis, obviously, is around politics and, and Facebook, and we're still very much living, living through that. So I don't think this has been an issue. It, it's, it's been a far bigger issue than, in a sense, what, what the TV broadcasters think of it. I think journalistically, the newspapers and the, um, and the broadcasters have, have, have kind of interrogated it journalistically extremely well. Cambridge Analytica is a historic moment, um, you know, that has occurred in the, in the last few months and it was made possible by people upstairs and at, and at Channel 4. So, uh, you know, these are big global issues and uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think more could be done, but I think the industry is also responding and there are quite big differences in my mind between, in a sense, where Facebook is today uh, and, and where sort of YouTube was about a year ago. It just seems to me like, um, I know your former employer at um, Channel 4, they did a sentiment analysis. So they're using tech to figure out how to figure out what, what mood people are in before they serve them the ad. That sounds very sort of big tech company type stuff. But there, was a, there was a flurry of comment around it. I, look, I think behavioral targeting um, is, is, is the world we are all in. And I think the key mm -hmm. issue is the transparency that you have with the individual user of your, of your brand or your services. And Channel 4 was very clear many years ago to have a... Uh, a viewer promise that was very transparent and which is, you know, very similar to where the whole industry has now uh, got to in terms of uh, European regulation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, you know, it's very clear that, that people do want better services. As Tom said, people, consumers enjoy the tech, just have to be very transparent mm -hmm. about how you collect and apply the data. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's do, let's go to our next, um, our next VT. This is VT3. Talk about consolidation. I think international consolidation has still got some way to go. Those big international players, including the tech companies, are going to keep trying to build scale greater and greater over time. In the UK, I think one of the big questions is, will the broadcasters be able to successfully come together to launch a shared SVOD service? Can they do so? And actually, is it too late? Bob Iger and Rupert Murdoch are clearly thinking, we can't do this alone. We need to combine um, forces to, to fight off that. Uh, uh, that competition. You've got large companies becoming even larger in order to super serve their customers and you've got niche companies who are looking to do a small range of things really 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 well and there's pretty much nothing in between. So better for whom? Um, the continued consolidation of the broadcast industry and the rise of the tech giants will lead to unprecedented levels of investment in both content and technology that will be better for viewers but for us all in both industries we'll be dealing and operating in a faster pace of change than ever before well size can help in producing globally appealing shows and in facilitating the investment in technology 
but really size isn't an end in itself. There's no question that consolidation will continue apace in the production industry. The media market is one that definitely rewards economies of scale. You can see that at the moment, given the vast amount of M&A activity. Um, but I don't think scale is a, a sufficient or necessary condition for success. At the end of the day, certainly speaking as a lawyer, you're only ever going to get as big as the uh, regulator and competition laws will permit you. I think for every bigger there will be somebody small who comes up from the bottom and disrupts. So I'd, we are going to see consolidation, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's better. And I do think we'll see some new players in the market that we don't even know yet. I was taught at school that Sir Francis Drake defeated the Armada with small ships that were agile. And so size isn't always what counts. <laughs> Right, so David, you should be happy. Size doesn't always count, right? That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's, let's look at the market cap chart, which is kind of fun, um, chart six. Uh, this kind of shows you where we are. Boy, Viacom's over there on the right, yeah. Um, on the left, we have Apple. Amazing, look at the, these are market cap valuations, obviously, and uh, one could make an argument about, you know, whether Netflix, which is not even at the, the far, side there, but uh, even deserves the market cap it has. But that's beside the point. That's where we are. Um, Tom, let me start with you. When you look at this, I mean, you're part of a company which is a consolidator. It, you know, Liberty Global does some consolidation. Um, what are the advantages of scale? We heard here, you know, economics, economies of scale. I mean, is it advantageous to be bigger? In, in many respects, in the industries we are, because of all the sorts of reasons that have, all, have been um, talked about today, absolutely. But it, it can't be an end in itself. And I think there's an important point that does come through those charts, is mm. that where, where the society does have to be active is in the application of antitrust law, okay. and which is fundamentally about ensuring the market does work. If we can have market-based... Mm -hmm. Uh, outcomes which are expressing the, the, the choice and the will of the people, there has to be um, uh, a governing structure that, that, that applies that. And uh, you know, I think we're seeing decisions now by, by um, antitrust regimes sort of thinking about that, where that, I mean, you know, famously we've seen some big fines come out of Brussels, whether they're, whether they're justified, whether they're the right size, what I'm not completely sure. But you do see public policy trying to think about that. But I think What's within that, but the other point I would make, it's, and I think it again came through the VT, the very good VTs, the, um, <laughs> being a challenger is a great position to be. I like competing with BT because they're so big, they're not very agile. And I say to uh, people in Virgin Media, what we don't want to become is like BT, mm. with due respect to my friends at BT. <laughs> um, so we, we are a biggish company, but in every market, uh, Liberty Global is, we are a challenger to, to an incumbent. And I think the biggest some of these companies get the, the more um, you know, little ships there will be, there's more opportunity underneath it. So as long as the antitrust law is working to the point that, it, that, that the new entrants don't get crushed and that there is effective competition, I don't think you have to worry about them being one. crushed, the new entrants. Well, I mean, if the new entrants are Google. I mean, what's interesting about no, what no, you say? No, I'm saying say? I don't, I don't, I don't, Google's not a new entrant. Okay. Google, Google is a very, very successful conglomerate. I mean, I wouldn't be calling Google a yeah. new entrant. So you mean new entrants like Wonderhood or something yeah, like that? Right. Yeah. The next Google. The next Google. <laughs> Be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so <laughs> it's interesting what you say, though, about uh, antitrust. There should be legislation. I mean, this isn't a tune that I hear no, often no, from. No, no I think Global. there is legislation. There mm -hmm. is legislation, mm -hmm. and I think we work within that legislation. The question is, is, is how it should be applied um, evenly in a pro-competitive way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the point of antitrust legislation is to let competition prosper, not, not diminish it. Okay. And, and, and there comes a point where, where it should be applied. So if I turn to um, Jane and Darren, um, do you think that Fangs will, will buy up large production businesses? I mean, we haven't seen a lot of that so far with the end of all shine sale, but do you think that that's their next move? I mean, they're obviously moved into commissioning quite aggressively, yeah? They've hired people who actually know how to commission TV-like content or premium content. Do you think they'll start consolidating companies like your own? It doesn't look like it, does it? That's all I would say. I mean, I think it's, for them, it's about um, getting the best content. It's about talent. I mean, I think what we call the arms race for content is actually an arms race for talent. And I think that's what they've been concentrating on. And mm -hmm. they've been doing that um, aggressively over the last sort of 
18 months, two years. Um, so I think we'll see more of that. I think, will they go out and buy Andamol? Will they buy producing companies? I don't think they need to, mm -hmm. but then you never know. If it secures them exclusivity over content, they may just take that step. Mm. It's a very easy thing for them to do economically. Let me ask you a lateral question. I mean, you're a part of, a, of Liberty Global in, in the sense that you're owned by two big companies. Yeah. You've got Discovery and Liberty Global. What's that like being part of a consolidated company? Does that help or hurt your agility, flexibility? in the marketplace? Look, so the model works very well for us. They are long term, in mm -hmm. their view, mm -hmm. which is, remember, we came out of private equity. That's right. So that's, that's different. Um, mm -hmm. they that's have, different. <laughs> they have funded us <laughs> and they have been supportive of all of the things that we've asked to do from a corporate development perspective. Yep. For our scale is about risk taking, by the way. So having big parents is helpful. You know, because you can take bigger risks. Yes, on it's much easier to take a risk if you know you're well capitalized and you're of a size that allows you to fail. And in this um, world, you really need to be able to deficit fund at a higher level, right? It's not to even get as simple as away. deficit funding because actually, relatively, that's a, a, an easier risk. It's a smaller decision to make. I mean, things like investing in you, into a new unit, very expensive talent, some IP rights, mm. just taking a punt on a development project that right. may or may not right. come through. Right. Those things are seriously risky, both reputationally and economically. And I think it's much easier to do that if John Malone is sitting in Denver, hopefully wishing you well and <laughs> looking out for you. So I think yeah. it does help. There's no doubt at all. Plus, actually, we're making, we're making a drama for Tom, yeah. um, Liberty Global Virgin Commission. Who would have thought? You know, that's, that's exciting. That's properly new. And that's mm -hmm. part of being in the group. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we work for Discovery, which we enjoy. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, really positive. So, Jan, how about you? I mean. To, con to be consolidated or not to be consolidated? Uh, you're independent, you've been fiercely independent. ITV tried to buy at one point. What, what do you think? Is there an advantage to being part of a bigger group in this world? It gives you more clout? Yeah, definitely. I think scale matters. Um, you know, having that, that, that backdrop of, of support, I think is a very important thing from a company standpoint. We have been fortunate enough to get to a size and scale where we've got a balance sheet to support some of those, you know, risks that we have to take as a company to continue to move forward. Um, it really does boil down to, I mean, we'd much rather be the consolidator than getting consolidated. But <laughs> wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all? <laughs> but, you know, we're focused really on the talent, the arms race for talent right now, and the underlying creative idea. If you own that idea and you, and you develop that idea, you incubate that idea, that gives you a, a place in the marketplace that's undeniable because you actually own it. Um, and then you do have a competitive advantage over anybody else because you own that underlying IP yep. idea. So that's what we've been focusing our, our, our resources on at this point. Um, it's almost like you say, it's an arms race for talent. It's an arms race to get the project, own the project so you can have the IP. It's right? twofold. I mean, it's it about is, pace. It is, you have to get in there and bid. You have to find the talent and bid before Netflix or Amazon shows yeah, it's up. It's the development that um, um, Jane talked about. It's also actually having the talent on staff or the relationships with talent yeah. that you can tee up for mm -hmm. the platforms or for the linear service providers. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a combination. Yeah, yeah. that's softer, some of that. You know, some, of, uh, some of that is softer stuff than just pure economics, by the yes. way, which is the thing that one should always remind anyone of in, in a creative environment. It, it, some of it is about those more intangible reasons that people want to be in a place and thrive in a place versus the real hard-nosed economic factors. Yeah, yeah. And I think, mm -hmm. I think they're critical. Yeah. And no, it's true. Particularly with talent, it comes yeah. down to culture as well, yeah, not, just, lot, not just a check. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So this is our last um, conclusion here. Now, this is the, 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 the idea that we talked about was if the end game is a small number of apps on your home screen or page, and we've already talked about prominence, um, acting as gatekeepers to the world of on-demand content, which ones are going to be surfaced? You know, it, this is kind of a big picture question. How do you see the business developing? Where are we going to end up as a television business? David, why don't you start? I think this is probably the, the biggest issue of all, because I think in, in our industry, which we know punches above its weight globally, we are for the first time going to be experiencing globally resourced portals. So the, you know, the Sky, Disney, Com all of that, and Netflix, Amazon. Effectively, we're all now competing globally. We're all supplying globally, but we're all competing and, as citizens. And I think that raises a really huge issue for, for not the regulator, but for government. Okay. 
uh, for law making, mm -hmm. not for law implementing. Okay. Which is, you know, really go, it goes back to this whole thing of who's owning the data, and if there, if if we globally consolidate around a small number of players that are rent-seeking citizens' data at industrial scales from DNA through to your viewing behavior, we're in a whole new world. Yep. And it's a whole new world that the Chinese are aggressively investing in, and uh, it's geopolitical. So, you know, really this is, this is an issue far bigger than anyone in this room could get their heads around, but it, hopefully people in government are beginning to look at this, particularly post-Brexit, because if you look five to 10 years out, if all of those portals are controlled through macro levels of data ownership, yeah. we as citizens no longer control uh, really sort of literally from DNA all the way through to, to every, everything else, all yeah. of our search behavior, everything. And yeah. that mm. is, is a mind-bending challenge for government, let alone sort of local regulators. And I think it's the overlap between these two issues at this point, which is the really, really big elephant in the room. So, Tom, when you see that, I mean, sort of data as the power and who, who has the data and who controls the portals. I mean, in some ways, you, you've got a platform, you've got a portal, you're, you're doing a lot, you know, but it, the, who's gonna, what's the end game? I mean, what should happen? Should be government be looking at this? Look, I think government is looking at it. I think, um, and certainly European regulation have the GDPR has significantly changed mm -hmm. uh, behaviour uh, um, uh, right across our industry and others. Uh, but again, I agree with David, and I go back to the earlier point. Overarching um, um, pro-competition legislation should be fundamentally addressing these issues, and I think that's a better approach than micro legislation, mm -hmm. and I think an issue with prominence, we've got to be very careful prominence doesn't become protection, because okay. whatever happens, you don't want to be looking at your status quo and say, well, that's a pretty good outcome for people who are in the current structure, and so we'll try and preserve that, because you can guarantee in this circumstance that's not going to be possible. Mm. Um, so, so I think it's, 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 it's keeping the business competitive, keeping these, the ideas flowing, keeping these distribution opportunities, pumping revenue, into the UK and seizing those opportunities, and it's the muscle of competition that's going to make the difference. And of course, it's going to be challenging, but gee, it's also very exciting, mm. isn't it? So, Darren, when you look at this from your perspective, you know, a couple of apps get surfaced, they become the ones. Does this make you worried as a content producer? No, I think it's uh, it, it goes back to what was said earlier before: is that you know, from a production standpoint, from a creative standpoint. People want to see ideas that are relevant to them. They want to see stories that are rele relevant to them. So there's the, the macro issues, the geopolitical issues that are way above my pay grade, but I can tell you that people in the, one, in the UK are going to want to see UK stories forever. So regardless to whether the platform is app-based, whether it's delivered globally by one company or whether it's a bifurcated approach where many different instances of the same content is served to the customer, the customer is going to, as always, seek out what they want, mm -hmm. and enjoy the content they want to see. So I think overall, net-net, from a production standpoint, from a co content standpoint, it's only good news, mm -hmm. and it will continue to be good news for us. Jane, final word, what do you think? Is this a scary world we're going into towards apps and data mining, or a good thing, potentially, for well, producers? It's look, it's a different thing, isn't it? It's um, a different thing. But I think, I think, I'm with Darren, I have to be on this. I think Ultimately, the, con the quality of the content, the desirability of the content is the test, and people will find it. Um, the tech obviously has to be there to allow them to access it, but people will find it, and they will watch it, they'll consume it, if that's the right word, um, whatever the platform, because they know it's good, mm -hmm. and they will test it, and they will find it's good, and then they will continue to watch it. Um, but it is really different. I mean, the role of marketing is different. All the things that David talked about as well, the sort of whole relationship with social media, different. The way we make programs must become more different. And I you're going to have to understand how those I think platforms we're not, work. I yeah. think that's probably an, an area that, um, that we've got some work as a production community to do. We've been relying on our intermediary a lot, mm -hmm. haven't we, yeah. the broadcaster? Yeah. Um, I think that will change. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this whole you know, the whole role of these platforms in the modern world. I mean, look what Stephen Lambert's got a show going out tonight on Channel 4 um, called The Circle, which is sort of touching on some of these things about how people use modern platforms to depict or portray themselves. Yeah. 
in a community of people, in this case obviously artificial, but I think it w could be very interesting. Yeah, very um, interesting. Listen, this has been a fascinating panel. Um, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I've enjoyed uh, running it. A full set of fangs. Could you please uh, join me in thanking our panel? We have David Abraham, Tom Mockridge, Jane Turton, and Darren Troop. Thank you.